150, um, just to let you know, we're code one and we'll be patrolling around the Sunshine CBD. Roger, thanks. Detective Acting Inspector Helen Chug and Senior Sergeant Jason Forster are out on patrol in Melbourne's northwestern suburbs. 260, um, how many um, suspects are we looking for? 21 Hot Eggberg and a vehicle stolen. Four offenders that have uh, jumped into the compliance vehicle and decamped from the address two minutes ago. It's four male heads on board hoodies, jeans, Caucasian, uh, two dark skinned males. Don't have a direction of travel. So, where was the car last seen? Okay, so what's the situation there now? Reports of a home invasion are coming in. Front flywire door was unlocked. Mm -hmm. The solid timber door behind it was locked. Mm -hmm. They've kicked that in, mm -hmm. damaged the lock. The four family members were seated around the kitchen table, made a demand for keys to the Audi. Then they've decamped back out the front door, got in the Audi, drove off. Okay, just yeah, if you can just get the units to keep an eye out for a black Audi um, 2013. It seems to be quite a brazen crime, isn't it, to kick in the door of a, someone's home while they're at home. Yeah, it's horrendous. Yeah, it's a horrendous crime, you know, absolutely it is, you know, when you kick in someone's door when they're at home, for sure. I got home as soon as I can. So they, they... Johnny's parents and sisters were inside when it happened. They just told me to just wait outside. So I, I don't know anything beyond that, to be honest. How are you feeling right now? Oh, you'll be a little bit distraught, yeah. <laughs> You know, didn't expect to come home to this. Violent home invasions like this have residents in these suburbs on edge. In March, Leah and her husband Gavin were asleep when four teenagers broke down their back door. I just remember just yelling and just screaming at us to just shut up and just give us money and and Gavin got out of the bed and um, physically pushed we had two of them in the room and he got up and physically pushed um, them out and sh shut the bedroom door on them he's then grabbed a baseball bat from underneath the bed at which point a hammer's come through the bedroom door multiple times of them trying to get in with us, with literally our entire body weight on the door, trying to prevent them from getting to us. Home security cameras captured Gavin chasing the young men out the front, but he couldn't stop them stealing both their cars. It's, tr it's too traumatising for me to go back there and remember it. I don't know how they can say that the crime rate is falling because everyone, like everyone I know doesn't, nobody feels safe. The teenagers, described as being of African appearance, are still on the run. Every time I see a black person down the street or just anywhere, it's like a trigger. Before all of this happened, I wasn't scared of black people or people of colour or whatever, but now it's like I can't even, like, face someone in a store that's black because of what's happened to me. And I think that's really unfair. It shouldn't be like that. It's not... It's not them, like, they haven't done anything wrong to me, but I can't help but associate that night with them, and that's what's really unfair. A 
We just need to call it for what it is, African gang boss. African gangs running riots, terrorising, robbing, wreaking havoc. Now, people are scared to go out to restaurants at the night time because they're followed home by these gangs. You guys know what you want? What's it, what's it? Yeah. They have to sit outside, boss. Do you feel like you have to be on your best behavior 24-7 because you feel like you're representing your skin color for everyone that's just like you, so you have to be this extra nice person, like, extra smile. Even if you're not feeling it that day, you just have to have a smile on because if you don't, you look scary. You get stared at. It's like, imagine someone's looking through you or, like, looking, like, you know, like, someone's eyes are just burning inside of your head. That's what it feels like, essentially. That's cool. I've got mixed garlic and sweet chili. Uh-huh. Okay. <laughs> I've got mixed garlic and sweet chili again. Yeah. And then I've got chicken. Thank you. Whoa, 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 whoa. 20 year old Titan was separated at birth from his parents during Sudan's brutal civil war. He hasn't seen them since. When I was born, um, the war and everything was happening, so me and my mom got separated. But my grandma, being the hero she is and, you know, the strong lady she is, took me with her. How many classes do you how many hours are you for? Melbourne has been his home since he was five. I've been in Fitzroy ever since, and it is creative as hell. So I'm trying to move there. But I don't know how much it costs, bro. Every day, I have to try to convince you, oh, I'm Australian. I think, you know what? We know we're Australian. We grew up here. Who do we have to, why, do, why should I have to convince you I'm Australian? Wherever they go, Titan and his friends feel judged. You gotta realize it's not, it's a, like 1% of us, right? There's crime in every single race. There's people that commit crime in every single race. But with us, for some reason, it gets put onto the whole culture. The whole, our whole, you know, culture gets blamed for the actions of the few now. Two armed gangs of young thugs are threatening a violent confrontation at tonight's Moomba Festival. Police arrived to reclaim the streets, but it was too late and they were outnumbered. The focus on African gang crime began in March 2016, when violence broke out at the Mumba Festival at Federation Square in the centre of Melbourne. We had um, two groups of, of African young people coming together in Melbourne. There was a fight broke out and it became a rolling mall, if you like. Some of that was because the police became involved and we started chasing these young people. People were seeing chairs being flown, they were seeing people being chased down the street by police, and that created a whole narrative in, in the media at the time and a lot of political pressure. I mean, you saw the videos. Those are stupid kids that got riled up, right? They did dumb stuff and they should be, you know? Like, it's not right what they did. I don't agree with it at all. It's, it was stupid. Police charged 37 people over the Mumba violence. Several were linked to a group known as the Apex Gang. So just a, a bunch of young kids uh, from a, uh, a small area of Dandenong is where it started. Uh, largely people from uh, a South Sudanese background, although we did have some Maoris and, and people from other uh, Pacific Islanders in that group. Apex was notorious for home invasions and carjackings in the city's southeast. Police say at its peak, the group numbered around 130 young men. But after an intense crackdown on Apex, police say it's now been dismantled. We just don't see them, you know, we're just not seeing that tag or that group uh, in, our, in our crimes anymore. 
Victoria Police are facing further criticism with claims they've lost control to street gangs. We have mayhem, we have anarchy. There is a specific problem in Victoria to do with people of African background. We need true law and order, we need safety. I don't see it as a, as a violent African gang crisis, no. Uh, certainly um, we have an issue. We have an issue with our youth in this state, but I believe that we are containing that issue. Okay, everybody, um, welcome to Regnant Shift. Now, tell me who's worked Regnant before. Show of hands. Detective Acting Inspector Chug is briefing her team before another night out on patrol. So just be careful that you don't get tied up uh, with other jobs. You are specifically here to respond to any high harm offending. Uh, they are part of a dedicated task force tackling youth crime in Melbourne's west. So the Wayward Task Force um, came about as a result of the evolution of the home invasion offence and carjackings and armed robberies that we were seeing being committed by multiple youth. People born in Sudan make up 0.1% of Victoria's population, but account for 1% of the state's alleged criminal offenders. Young Sudanese males are overrepresented in certain violent crimes, allegedly committing close to 10% of aggravated robberies. The Wayward Task Force is currently monitoring around 80 youth offenders, of which police say a large portion are from the South Sudanese community. We do know that they are responsible disproportionately for some of those high crime or high harm offences, particularly aggravated burglaries and robberies. Um, so that, that's concerning for us and that's the issue that we've been dealing with for a couple of years now. So that, you know, the, in terms of numbers, overall numbers for that high crime, um, uh, high impact crime, the numbers are, are quite small. Victoria had a spike in violent crime in 2016 and aggravated burglaries are still at some of the highest levels in five years. But over the last two years, there has been a decrease in violent crime. When you look at youth crime in particular, we have the second lowest youth crime rate in Australia, only behind the ACT. Productivity Commission measures Victoria now as the most fearful state in the nation. Why are people feeling so scared if crime is dropping? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting one. It's certainly, uh, uh, you know, one of the one of the things that Victoria Police and, and the community really need to focus on, not only do people have to be safe, they have to feel safe. So there's a lot of perception issues I think that we need to deal with as well. Victoria has the largest South Sudanese population in Australia with approximately 9,000 people. It's an overwhelmingly young community, which is the peak age for criminal offending. When we look at the commonalities across offenders, we know there's a really strong connection to low socioeconomic communities. There's a real um, connection to people that are um, and have breakdowns in their family structures, in their community, in their cultures. We are actually doing a lot of things that people don't know um, that we are trying our best. Over the past few months, counsellor Dr Santino Deng has been running parenting workshops for South Sudanese families. These parents are in despair at how their community is being portrayed and they want tips on how to keep their kids out of trouble. <laughs> Most of the things that you used to know are no longer there. A lot of parents are very depressed, stressed and angry, sometimes toward their own children as well for you know, some of the issues that young people are doing. They come from a culture where parenting was done differently. Now in Australia, you cannot do it maybe the way they used to do it. 
مثلا تنبيه وقت ميد ميد أكيد تاد لكن تاني إن شاء الله ميد بان تاد ما أنا وجه نيان وين كنا. Many South Sudanese families here are female-headed households. Widows with children were often prioritised for refugee resettlement. Lacking male role model in the family is a major contributing factor. Back home, for instance, even if you don't have the you know husband in the house, uncle would be there, other family, other relatives. But in Australia, you can you know you get confined in your own house. You know you don't have much support around. There is what we call role reversal within the family, where children start to speak a very good language and they understand the system. They become more powerful because they understand the language and the culture. So th these changes can really impact on parents. They feel like they don't have power. They they don't have much control. Come on, man. Nineteen year old Adim came to Australia from South Sudan with his brother when he was just three. He's not seen his mum or dad since. I had to grow up myself and I had to like figure out how to grow and be, become a man myself. I could I could easily be doing other stuff. I could probably be locked up or like, you know, I, I could be like, yo, I don't have my mum, I don't have my parents here. Then what's the point, like, what's the point of doing what I do? He has a photo of his mum on his phone screensaver and dreams of going to visit her in South Sudan. I wake up every day and I see the photo and I'll be like, whatever I do today, I'm doing it for her to make her happy. Adim's friend Arrow has five brothers and sisters. He says his mum is worried for him. My mom doesn't even know what to think anymore. Like, I can tell her all the things in the world, but she's a stay-at-home mom. All she does is believe what the news says. She also looks at us like, whoa, these kids are out of control. She can't even trust me because whatever I say, you know, Channel 7 will say otherwise for three weeks straight. So it's like, she doesn't know what to say. Adim and Arrow have started a music label called 66 Records. Arrow is one of the managers and Adim an aspiring rapper. With well, 66 Records, we're the first, what we think is the first black-owned label in Melbourne, in Australia. The thing that brings us all together is we never really had shit. We never really had anything, you know? All we have is each other. And the same, we're all on the same mission. We just want to be the first ones to make it, you know? I don't know anybody that owns a Ferrari here in Melbourne. I don't know anyone with a mansion, you know? Why can't that be me? I'm black, I'm 6'5", and I'm dark skin, really dark skin. You know what I mean? I'm really dark skin. So to other people that are not like me, I'm a threat. So it's hard for me to walk these streets sometimes, because when I try to walk these streets sometimes, I'm seen as a threat. You know what I mean? I actually walk outside, go to a shop, try to buy something, and they look at me as a thief. Even though I have my money and my coins in my pocket, they still look at me as a black thief. Since the whole Apex thing being on the news, I mean, I can't even get a job. You know? I can't, I can't really put... I can have all the qualifications in the world, but if I pull up to the interview and I'm Sudanese, it's like, we should watch this guy. Maybe we should... 
you know, be more cautious. And just, you know, probably transport, you know. People would rather stand from Flinders Street to Dandenong than sit next to me, you know. I get followed around in this grocery store with my mom, like I'm stealing groceries. I just, you know. I don't know, in school they tried to tell me I couldn't hang out with a group of more than four people because we looked like we were doing something. I'm like, I, so they're basically telling me I can't live because I'm black. This is what they're telling me. Now there's a new threat to public safety, a gang calling itself menace to society. The members of 66 Records are acutely aware of how many see them, and they play up to that image. But first, this report. Uh, I'm ready. I'm ready for that war. In this video, they mock the commercial media's coverage of African gangs while they jump around with knives and rap about committing crime. I'm advised they've put videos out that are certainly anti-establishment, anti-police and, and promote violence. Can you understand why the police would look at those lyrics or look at that music and be worried about it? The reason we made the video was to profit off this fear, basically. Like, we just, we just some young kids being creative, like, it's like a movie to us, you know? It's like we made our own movie, but we're getting crucified for it, basically. I don't know. I don't know, I don't know what I can say, what I can do to make the public believe me when I say I'm not, you know, I'm not crazy, I'm not a criminal. What can I say to you? If that's already the perception you have and you don't want to speak to me, what can I tell you? The police are on their way to investigate a car crash. A car load of Africans have hit the front fence and are now hanging around in the front yard. Apparently there's a car full of people of African appearance. Uh, we've got a couple of vans heading there. Uh, 241 just asked me if there's a Huawei unit that could perhaps head there as well. <laughs> it turns out there are no Africans involved. An L plater has badly overshot a roundabout, and a young South Asian man rushed to help. Uh, all of a sudden, it happened like from that side, it came uh, around 50 to 60 kilometers per hour, and it just hit these fences here. This man called the police for his elderly parents. Just looking for cars. And they just stressed out. They thought there's going to be a riot at, riot at the front. They're ringing me up, thinking someone did it deliberately. My heart, very bad. But they didn't know that it was an alpha. Very sick. It was just a. Too much scared. And why did you think there was going to be a riot? They thought it was Africans out the front for some reason. I don't know. Why are you feeling scared at the moment? What, what's been on the news? What have you been hearing? Just the crime in general. They they always watch the yeah. news. We've certainly seen it happening more uh, in recent times where yeah, people are uh, you know, not actually clearly seeing who's involved and um, because of all the media attention they have jumped to the conclusion that it's, it's uh, African offenders. What happens to us? They get rehabilitated, they get sent back out into the community. I'm living with a life sentence every day. It's rare for a judge to speak publicly, but County Court Chief Judge Peter Kitt thinks the current atmosphere is dangerous. Silence, all stand, please remain standing. 
this political question as to whether there's a crime wave or crime panic, I'll leave that to the politicians and the journalists and the social commentators to debate. I'm concerned with, as my judges are, uh, with practising the law. Uh, we're concerned with applying the rule of law. In this court, we're sentencing 1,600 people a year and only a tiny proportion of those sentences receive any media coverage. They're often the sensational, the salacious, or the apparently lenient. If you are an African offender, and certainly if you're an African youth of South Sudanese background from the western suburbs of Melbourne, rest assured your case will be reported upon. The media choose to report upon those cases. That creates an impression that, we, that our work, a very significant proportion of our work is taken up with African youths from the western suburbs of Melbourne. That's a false impression. There is a lot of anger in the community from people who think that the courts aren't being tough enough on youth offenders. Yes. What do you say to those people, particularly victims of crime? I think there's a misunderstanding out there in the public that we sentence for victims and victims alone. We don't. Yes, they are a very important consideration in the sentencing process, but the rule of law requires a judge to sentence in the public interest. The public interest requires a number of considerations. Some of those considerations might not sit comfortably with victims. We also know that with young people, that they're great vehicles for reform. An 18-year-old or 19-year-old has the real capacity to turn his or her life around. So the law says, look, we need to seize that opportunity. We sentence people on an individualised basis. So we're not engaged in this, in any kind of box ticking exercise. Um, if, if, for example, somebody comes to us and they, they, um, they're black African um, of South Sudanese background from the western suburbs of Melbourne, we don't just tick a box and say, well, therefore they're going to get a higher sentence or a lower sentence, as the case may be. Such an approach would be uh, racist. The public is being told uh, that there is a crisis um, that there is, that they live in a, um, a state that is becoming lawless. The offending by um, African young people, despite it being 1%, has gained more attention than the overwhelming 71% of offending um, committed by um, Australian-born people. Well, I think um, what we've seen is certainly what are elements of what I'd call moral panic. We're seeing um, headlines and, and reporting that um, exacerbates a problem and, and, and rep reporting on things that we're not necessarily seeing. So that causes us some concern. And as, certainly when you read social media and other uh, reporting platforms, uh, it's driving community angst and uh, you know people are seeing African crime everywhere, which is not necessarily the case. Throughout this year, tensions have been building. Police have been under increasing pressure to be seen to act. In August, dozens of teenagers met at a park in Taylor's Hill for a planned fight between two teenage girls. <laughs> Tell us, what do you know about the truth of what happened at Taylor's Hill? It was over, you know, it was over a nude. It was over, like, a picture or a video or something that happened. And it was like, it's so... Teenagers being stupid, essentially, right? Oh, it was everywhere on social media, right? So everyone that lived in that area was like, went to see what happened. Mainly when I first walked out, it was the fear of what, what could happen with the kids because there was that many of them. David Driscoll lives around the corner from the park. They do all these criminal acts and then you see on the news and all that that they get away with it. Why do they get away with it? African gangs are here. The government and councils and the police say they're not here. They are here and people, residents, are scared. A police helicopter and the riot squad were called in. The kids threw rocks at police, 
and a patrol car had its back window smashed. No injuries were reported and no arrests were made. The group of about 100 youths, mostly of African appearance, had met up with plans to fight each other. Media reports said 100 African youths were there that night. Police say the number was closer to 30. We had reports of damage at the Water Garden Shopping Centre. Again, we've gone back to Shopping Management Centre there. Uh, they're not reporting any crimes to us. Uh, police walking around telling people to go inside and lock their doors um, because, you know, the dire consequences of what may occur. Again, that never occurred. Can you say then that the police overreacted? I mean, was it the police presence that actually exacerbated the community's fears? Uh, it certainly contributed to it. There were many residents who lived out in that area who were fearful for them for their safety that night. And that's the challenge for us. So we got large numbers of police in to execute our powers and our responsibilities. That the balance for us is then you then exacerbate that that feeling or that perception of fear. The next day, a special response unit patrolled the area to reassure residents. We had intelligence that um, the circumstances that were at play on the night at Taylor's Hill were still very much alive and active the day after. 17-year-old Martin and his friend Deng, who'd had nothing to do with the incident the night before, were studying at the local library. We see like about six officers walk in, yeah. and then two behind them come in, yeah. and then they came and told us our time's up. So we asked him, like, what do you mean about time's up? Come on, move on. You need to touch me. And then they close Deng's laptop, and then they throw it on the floor. They grab his bag, and then they started grabbing all of us, like, forcibly. That's the guy who grabbed me. The guy just grabbed me. For no reason. We ask them what's going on, they don't want to tell us the reason. Just get out from the library. So we went downstairs, we were at the bus stop. They're like, just get inside the bus stop, or else we're gonna give you a fine. No, you get on the bus right now. Yeah, wait for a bus. They just said, you've been identified. I'm like, identified how? And they were just saying, you've been identified, you have to leave. If you come back, you will be arrested. And is this the first time that something like this has happened to you? Yeah, yeah, first time, yeah. Deng was fined $347 for not moving on fast enough after leaving the library. For no reason when you're driving. How did that make you feel by now? They're both working with lawyers from the Flemington Kensington Legal Centre to file an official complaint against police. So, Deng, why do you think the police forced you out of the library at this time? Because they're black, I reckon. Yeah, that's what I know. Well, what we were doing was providing reassurance to the whole of the community out there. But... How does it reassure the community to move along two young South Sudanese men studying in a library? Well, the, the bigger picture is that there was a whole lot of conversation coming out of Taylor's Hill that the police hadn't done enough. September, 66 Records held their official launch party at the Gasometa Hotel in Collingwood. It was one of the biggest nights for young South Sudanese people all year. And in the current climate, both police and 66 Records were on high alert. We had legal advisors at the show and outside the show had warned the police about, um, obviously, the amount of people we expected to come. And what else? John put out a statement telling the crowd to not give the public and the police what they wanted, is Sudanese kids fighting. And 
police had met several times with 66 Records and the venue to discuss security. They had concerns about some of the people attending. They are people that we manage through Operation Wayward because of their criminal history and they're either on bail or there's some sort of, um, I guess, other intelligence at play which, which informs us or suggests to us they're actively involved in criminal activity. Titan was there as a trained legal observer to try and make sure there was no trouble. I was upstairs just watching the performance and stuff, right? I was like, yeah, this is amazing. And seeing people smile, people, people dance, I was just, I was proud. The police had came, walked in while, you know, we were performing, and it seemed like everything was secured. But at around 2.30 a.m., once the main performance was over, a fight broke out. Someone got punched inside, right? And then their friends went to defend them, where it was like, oh, yeah, I just got punched. Like, why did you punch my cousin and stuff like that, right? And then that just escalated. When did I try to break it up? We broke it up. More than 200 people caused mayhem in Collingwood after a violent brawl broke out, fueled by a group of youths. Went, were taken outside and those guys were beginning to fight with the other group but they were outnumbered so one of their friends got into his car I'm screaming at people move get off you know get off the road and stuff right people start getting off the left to the left side there's still a group of people there I see this guy come drive, like, into the group of people, right? A car hit the crowd. A 19-year-old South Sudanese man faces multiple charges. Arrow's 18-year-old cousin was badly injured. His leg was later amputated. He is a real bright young kid, you know? He's always had you know, real energy about him. He's the one that makes the, you know, the whole family smile. And he was a great basketball player. He was about to go out and get a scholarship to play basketball. It's kind of heartbreaking that, you know, for us to put on a show like this for our community, they couldn't respect us enough to, you know, hold back from fighting just for one night. Police were criticised for allowing the event to go ahead. Were we happy um, with the outcome of that event? That absolutely not. You know, it was an horrendous outcome. So I don't think anyone could stand back and say, well, that was a successful event and we should all be happy with um, what we did. We have those in the wake of the incident, uh, the police incident. and the media the focused, focused their attention uh, on 66 records. We've yeah. been told that Label 66 um, had the attention of police for the last 12 months or so due to the hate rap that they produce. Um, can police confirm this? Certainly, Record 66 is something uh, uh, of a concept of, of a group that we've been well and truly aware of and we've been monitoring. What about 66 Records themselves? Does that group stand accused of any links with criminal activity? Uh, not that I'm aware of, no. It's easier for them to say that we're criminals than for them to say that these are some young black men successfully opening their own record label and, and so selling our shows. It's easy for them to say, nah, they're not really doing that. For many in the South Sudanese community, these days feel familiar. In 2007, there were similar headlines about African gang crime in Melbourne. That year, 19-year-old Liap Goni was murdered. The community is holding the first public memorial to commemorate his death.
Martha Ojulu is Leap's mother. And who bagan mutot banyog me nakaje? Kapaje ko anpala. Chuno yu bena lao kwak nai niye. Diel tote shoka kagan kwak makaba ye kai kapane kan ye anpala wa mutot ka jo. The media wrongly reported that Leop's death was related to African gangs. But it was two white men who beat him to death with poles. At least one of his killers, before he had killed Leop, had sprayed fuck niggers or something on, on the wall of their rental apartment and had been heard shouting that he was going to take his anger out on some blacks and that he was going to, he wanted to kill blacks. And then they went out um, that night and found Leo um, and beat him with metal poles. And one of the guys says, I think I just killed a nigger. When Leop died, there were conversations about police having lost control. You know, the idea of a lawless state. It's not just a debate, you know. For me, the consequences, at least from what I experienced through, through what happened to Leop, can be fatal. This community came here in search of safety. But as fear and distrust build outside these walls, they wonder what the future will be for them and their children. I really do not feel like I belong here at all. I feel like um, my parents made a mistake by trying to bring me here. And I feel as though you know, in the next 10 years or so, there's not gonna be a, anywhere for my siblings to go comfortably because they're Sudanese, you know? I feel as though my, my little brother's not gonna be able to go get a job or get rent because of, you know, just of how they're portraying us right now, like we're demons. It's really good to see a lot of young people here. I'm very excited to see you guys. It's always good seeing you guys here at least. I have, at my worst, thought whether I should move you know, whether I should leave this country. I normally describe it as feeling under siege. I feel as a, as a member of the African community, you're quite aware of it all the time. Thank you very much. And I can only describe it as, uh, you know, at an individual level, um, as, as almost like a stain you can't get rid of. <laughs> 